Hi, my name is Ryan Slobogin, and I'm here with Rod Johnson, the creator of the Spring Framework and former CEO of SpringSource. Hi, Ryan. Good to talk Hi. to you. Good to talk to you, too. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. I um, went for a beautiful run this morning. Weather in San Francisco is fantastic, so, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Now, since, so, so as I mentioned, you're the, the former CEO of SpringSource. Since leaving SpringSource, you've gotten involved with a variety of different companies and projects, technologies, and et cetera. Um, one of those is Neo4j. What, what's your, why are you involved with Neo4j? What, like, kind of what's the landscape there? Well, I guess before I speak specifically to Neo uh, technologies, it's probably good to think about or talk about why I'm involved with startups in the first place. And, you know, I, I certainly love the idea of building something that we did with SpringSource, building a technology. I loved working with a team of talented people. And, you know, that's been really a big driver for me. So I think with uh, Neo Technology, the initial driver was meeting Amel. Actually, I uh, met um, Amel at... Um, what would have these days been called the go-to conference um, in Aarhus um, a few years ago. And I was just really impressed by the guy. I was really impressed by the way that he thought about databases as a whole. Like he, you know, seemed very, very well aware of the different uh, technology choices that um, users have. And, you know, I think for me being involved in just about any company, I have to believe in the technology and I also have to believe in the people. And then, you know, if there's something I can do to hopefully help, that's, you know, that's great. And it's usually a lot of fun. I was reading something the other day and it was talking about investment and at the angel versus the Series A level. And it was, talk, it was saying some along the lines of as long as you have an interesting challenge and a team of dedicated people, that's basically enough for angel investment. But then once you get into Series A, then you want to start proving out the market, et cetera. So I guess it, is, is that... Does that agree with what, what you're thinking, like what you do? Or are you doing angel investing or serial CA or? Um, I've done a mixture of both. I'm probably more involved in companies that are kind of series A or post series A than um, really, really early stage um, angel investments. Uh, but, you know, I think it's difficult to talk about today's uh, software investment climate because it's changed a lot. So there is a proliferation of angels um, out there now. And there actually seems to be a lot more angel funding the, available than, say, there was uh, when we started out with SpringSource. Whether or not that's a good or bad thing, uh, time will tell. Uh, but certainly, I mean, right now, the funding environment is fairly, fairly positive for entrepreneurs. And also a really interesting thing is that companies are consuming less money in general than, say, they would have 10 years ago. So, you know, techniques for developing software are more productive than they used to be. The cloud gives you an opportunity to, you know, set up some service without going and buying racks full of servers. So, you know, actually, I think with both the proliferation of angels and with the fact that companies don't need to burn money as fast, it's actually a pretty, pretty interesting time. For entrepreneurs. I do think that there is potentially though a crunch where yes there are definitely angel investors who are less demanding than series A investors and that can be a problem because you know that can need to lead to a nasty reality check when entrepreneurs need to raise the next round of financing. Uh, so you know I think as we've always known there are good VCs and less good VCs I think the same is true with angels. You know, there are highly sophisticated angels who, you know, provide tremendous value to companies, and there are angels who are less sophisticated and potentially, um, you know, set um, up situations that aren't going to work very well later. Interesting. Now, you had mentioned that um, that companies were doing basically, we were kind of able to do more with less like on the money front. Now, is that because the software development landscape has changed through things like AWS being available to reduce costs or other clouds being able to reduce costs? or what, What's your sense of that? I think it really depends on the nature of the technology. For example, if you're doing what Neo Technology is doing and building a database, 
that's not that much different from, say, doing it 10 years ago. You know, fundamentally, you're wrestling with some really difficult um, problems around storage and algorithms and locking and distribution. So, you know, you're dealing with things that are simply hard and don't magically get easier. But let's imagine, for example, that you're developing some kind of consumer-facing app. Unless you're dealing with insane levels of volume like Facebook or Twitter, you have a range of technology choices that are pretty productive. Um, these days, you don't have to go and buy um, racks and racks of service. You can very cheaply start off with Amazon or Heroku. You, know, you might want to think about how that cost adds up as you go down the track. But initially, your setup cost is going to be pretty significantly lower. And you know, I think I think that is actually uh, a very positive thing. It's interesting that you mentioned that one of the one of the other uh, projects, companies, etc., that you worked with is Elasticsearch. And I know Elasticsearch is one that, both from kind of anecdotal evidence in industry and also from my own work, it's really easy to get going. It's really easy to set up. It's very cloud friendly. It's just. It just seems to work really well and just automatically scale and et cetera. So it, what are the reasons that, that you're working with Elasticsearch? Well, again, I think it comes down to belief in the technology and the people. Um, like it, with Elasticsearch, I've um, known Shai for a number of years. I mean, I think the guy's you know, a remarkable technologist. He's created a fantastic piece of software and a great community around it. And Stephen Sherman, of course, who's the C. EO um, was one of the co-founders of SpringSource. So, you know, I've, Stephen and I have been colleague, colleagues and friends uh, for years. So, you know, Elasticsearch was a pretty easy decision. Uh, also, the lead investor is Peter Fenton at uh, Benchmark, who was our lead investor at SpringSource, and another person that I love working with and have a lot of respect for. But, you know, I think probably the single biggest factor with Elasticsearch was the size of the community and the rapidity with which the community is growing. It really is of a scale and level of growth that is comparable, in fact, I think slightly exceeds where we were at with SpringSource. And that's, that's unusual. There simply aren't many things that achieve that level of growth and adoption in the open source community. And that just gives you a tremendous opportunity to figure out how you can add value to your users that enables you to grow uh, a really significant business. And I think you, your point actually about the fact that Elasticsearch is easy to use, you know, I think that also reflects that change in the world that I mentioned because obviously Elasticsearch is attractive to startups. And in a world where you can get going more uh, cost effectively in terms of your hardware utilization, etc. Yes, you're not going to expect that you have the project plan for installing WebSphere. Uh, I remember actually, probably to show how much the world had changed, I was working uh, probably, I think it was 2000, at ft.com, which at the time was one of the um, highest volume websites in Europe. And we were evaluating app servers. IBM would not give me the software. They told me that they'd have to send a consultant on site to install WebSphere. Oh, wow. <laughs> we ended up on WebLogic, and I got WebLogic running you know, in half an hour. Uh, but you know, I think that, that back then was obviously not considered that strange. Admittedly, I said, well, no thanks, please go away. But you know, clearly enough people accepted that. Uh, back then that they were able to get away with it. Whereas now, you know, people are not going to have the project plan for installing the application server. Hmm. Yeah, that's... And of course, back then, people did a lot of waterfall software development as well. I mean, they, you know, had project plans for producing UML diagrams for eventually producing code. My favourite ever quote um, from any of my work experiences was probably 2000, late 2002, and it was an architect who worked for a very large... Um, in national um, software consultancy. And I expressed concern that there hadn't been any code deliveries and the first milestone of the project was due in six weeks. And he said, 
but there are complete UML diagrams. What do you hope to see from running code that you can't see from UML diagrams? Oh, man. I, uh, how actually, about running code? <laughs> I actually laughed in the meeting. I mean, I, I guess it was actually very rude, um, but I couldn't help it. It was like, I mean, how do you react to that? <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I just that's a completely different mindset. Wow. <laughs> uh. yes. And actually, perhaps unsurprisingly, there never was any running code from um, that consultancy on that project. Mm. Um, they departed before there was any code at all. <laughs> so. Actually, another aspect, thinking back to 2000, I know that one of the things that seemed to be a common, although certainly not good at that point, was I know one of the projects I was working on, it was emitting... HTML from servlets with embedded JavaScript, which, I mean, the, the, num the levels of hurt there are crazy. Now, one of the other things you worked with is Meteor.js, and that's, I'm assuming, making web user interfaces just a little bit better? Well, I think it's a lot better. I mean, I think that web interfaces are something that really haven't been addressed well by traditional technologies. I mean, if you look at the technologies that have been dominant in building web interfaces, they're not very well adapted to a modern world where there's all these different devices. Users expect a um, greater rapidity of interaction. They really don't expect the old paradigm that you make a request and you get a whole page. So if you look at the kind of things that people do with Java or PHP or Rails, it's all the same kind of model where fundamentally it's geared towards a request goes to the server and it brings back a page. And what they do is they, you know, retrofit a bunch of JavaScript kind of stuff that, you know, is not really core to the model, and they end up with something very complex. I mean, I think actually, to be honest, one of the better jobs of retrofitting is what they've done in Spring MVC. I think um, the more recent work in Spring MVC um, is actually quite nice. But nevertheless, this is still, in the long term, it's not a viable solution. In the long term, you have to rethink the way web interfaces um, work and the fact that you know they're now about different devices, potentially concurrent use of different devices, and the old notion of a page is you know is just meaningless. Uh, and where I think Meteor really have a lot of potential is firstly they unify the programming model in terms of JavaScript on client and server. And secondly, they really focus directly on the data synchronization challenge. So how do you keep what is happening on the client? How do you push out to the client in a very easy way without you know, having to write a bunch of kind of custom polling code or whatever that's you know, pretty unnatural? Interesting. And TypeSafe is another one. Now, when I think of TypeSafe, I also think of the Play framework and how they've got similar ideas for how they're kind of updating how web interactions happen. Um, and they're they're primarily Scala, and TypeSafe has a lot of Scala. What's what's the what's the involvement interest on TypeSafe? Like, how do you see that going? I mean, there are, seems to be a lot of interesting things that can come out of that. I'm curious to curious to get your thoughts. I'm a big fan of uh, Scala as a programming language, and I'm also a fan of the actor model. So in terms of what ACA does uh, in more efficient and less error-prone um, use of modern compute resource. Uh, so you know, with TypeSafe, I guess the, the biggest driving factor was my love of the Scala language. Uh, and also, again, the fact that I know people there. I mean, uh, Mark Brewer is someone that um, I worked with um, for years at Spring Source. And, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, Martin and Jonas, I mean, you know, they've got some li literally rock stars in terms of the technology stack. Uh, I think that Scala is a big part of the future of the JVM. I think it's, I think it's a really, really nice language. And I think it actually provides some of the benefits that people associate with dynamic languages while retaining strong typing. And I think that's a very interesting uh, benefit. 
Interesting. Now, that, that kind of relates to another question, which is the future of Java the language versus Java the platform. So what do you see, what do you see happening there? So Java the language, I mean, like there's, there's some pain trying to get Java 8 out the door because of language features, and there's been this talk of back to the future, how it's including things like lambdas, which have been in other languages. It, essentially, like things are being bolted on. It, there's, there's some concern that I've heard anyways that Java the language might be starting to kind of reach the end of its, the end of its usable life. Or do you think that's true? And do you think that other languages like Scala are going to pick up from there on the basis that is the JVM and the APIs, et cetera, that have been built up over 20 years? Or uh, what do you see going on there? It's an interesting question. I think the JVM has a value that is greater than the value of Java. And you know, it's a very, very robust piece of code. It performs extremely well. And you know, I think that when people dismiss Java, they often forget that. So, for example, you know, with obviously the Ruby on Rails crowd were very anti-Java, and the fact is that in reality they've had some very, very high-profile failures of people who had to get off their platform and ended up on the JVM. I'm not saying that Ruby's bad, but I'm saying that you know there is a core strength in Java and the JVM that needs to be understood and respected. So, having said that, is Java going away? No, I don't think so. I mean, Java is currently um, roughly with C, equal, most popular language. I don't see that changing dramatically anytime soon. But yes, Java has probably peaked. I mean, we're, you know, we're not going to see the um, level of enthusiasm that we had around Java, say, 10 years ago. And that's probably good because it looked actually like the industry was heading to a monoculture where the solution to every problem was Java. I think we've actually got a more rational balance now where people are willing to look for the languages and tooling that are appropriate to solve particular problems. So I think that Java quite possibly will be the last language blockbuster. I don't know that we'll see another language like C or C++ or Java that has gotten that massive le level of adoption. I think instead we'll probably see greater specialization I think Java will probably go into a long but very slow decline, and I think on the JVM, other languages, most notably Scala, will start to um, take up some of the slack. I think the you know the JVM is going to be a dominant technology in the enterprise for many many years, but I can envision a greater percentage of those applications over time gradually, you know, moving more towards Scala and introducing more Scala in place of Java. And it's interesting, you had mentioned the JVM and you mentioned Ruby. Now, one of the Ruby implementations which seems to have gotten very popular is JRuby. And like with Charles Nutter and with Tom and Abel and all the work that they put into it. It seems to, from what I can tell, it's becoming a very, very popular Ruby implementation. So that seems like an interesting mix of here's a language which has gotten some of the popularity, and yet you have the JVM, which is this solid, really well-proven piece of software that's been around for a long time now, and you, you get the two together, and that becomes, I guess it's an evolving, ongoing platform. Yeah, I think it clearly the... Um case of JRuby is really important because it shows that you can have a language that isn't Java-like successfully on the JVM as platform. Uh, and there are numerous benefits in that. One benefit is that the JVM is pretty, pretty heavily optimized, so there's a whole lot of work that's been done around that. But another benefit is that generally organizations don't want to put in more runtimes. So, you know, the, if they have a JVM, they probably have the ability to manage that JVM. They have the um, tooling around it, monitoring, etc. And if you go and put in a completely different runtime, that's actually something that can be more pro problematic. So there's definitely a benefit in, you know, having a fewer number of runtimes. I mean, I think that... One of the really, really nice things about uh, Scala is that the interoperability with Java is so amazingly good. I mean, it's 
you know, it's similar to Groovy. It's uh, in the sense that you really can extend objects written in Java. You know, you, you have a very um, nice and natural uh, way to interoperate between the two languages. Obviously, that gets more difficult if you have a language that's not Java-like and not strongly typed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you start to get into a, a real mismatch between the capabilities of the two languages, I would imagine. Well, I, I guess you're partly looking at the interoperability being in the JVM through things like into Invoke Dynamic, rather than you know necessarily more in terms of the actual language model. But I mean, there's obviously still a value uh, in that. So you had mentioned you had mentioned ACA and with Scala with the actor model, and that seems like a model which is far more intuitive and far easier to debug from a concurrency perspective. So do you think that's going to be one of the things that helps to drive Scala more is ACA being, I guess, most most at home in Scala? I mean, there's, there's Java implementation, but it seems most at home in Scala. And is that going to help to drive the adoption of Scala as we get more and more of these multi-core things? Basically, as CPUs continue to scale out in number of cores as opposed to raw power? I think that with respect to ACA, yes, it will help to drive Scala. But I think it's actually, frankly, a good thing for ACA and for the Java community in general that um, Java 8 will obviously be nicer to use ACA in than um, Java 7 um, when you, know, you have some functional support in the Java language. So I think, yes, definitely, if people fall in love with ACA, they're going to, I think, be very likely to look at Scala. And similarly, people who are in love with Scala are probably more likely to be aware of the actor model and you know, find that very interesting. But with Java 8, the ability of Java developers to benefit from, act, from the actor model in ACA will be greatly improved. Um, because it will certainly it'll, you know, look more like using ACA in Scala than it looks like using ACA in Java 7. I mean, I still don't think that's going to cause people who um, like um, it's not going to cause people who like um, Scala to switch to Java. I mean, I think you know you're still still looking at a pretty big gap there. So one of the other discussions that I've heard coming up more and more frequently in the last couple of years, uh, talking about the kind of like ongoing industry changing changing practices. I've I've heard discussions about how dependency injection is now in many ways considered an anti-pattern. I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on that. I think obviously the applicability of dependency injection varies between different apps and different languages. So you know the if you start off with the assumption that any technology is universally applicable, you're setting yourself up for applying it in ways that aren't going to look good. However, I think if you look at um, the basic uh, problems that dependency injection solves, like, um, for example, externalizing certain concerns like configuration from business logic to enhance testability, you know, I, I think that has proven its value in many, many applications. And I, you know, I think that's equally um, applicable um, today. So one of the one of the talks I saw you give at QCon San Francisco 2011 was it was a keynote saying about things you wish you had known. Now, given that the industry has changed so much since 2000, if you were at the point again where you were 30 and writing a book and creating a framework, given what you know now, what would you do the same, and what would be different? It's actually really difficult to answer that question, and one of the primary reason for that is that what I did with Spring and in my books really came out of what I was doing every day for many years. So, you know, I, I think like a lot of open source technologies, it came out of a pain um, or, you know, scratching an itch. So it's kind of, to be honest, it's difficult to answer that today because I don't spend all day every day writing code. And therefore, my assessment of the level of pain um, and how to potentially improve the developer's experience, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the same place, if that uh, makes sense. If I was to distill it, it kind of sounds like the advice is find the thing that causes you the most pain and solve it because there's a good chance that a lot of other people are experiencing the same pain. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it really comes down to a question of authenticity, particularly in the open source world. It's really hard to say, hmm, okay, let's have a look at Scala or let's have a look at cloud computing and let's find an opportunity for an open source project and then we'll start a business on it. I don't think it works like that. I think typically the things that really resonate with developers are things that come with a profound sense of authenticity because people didn't just say, hey, I want to create some open source. They said, well, this thing about my job sucks. I'm going to fix it. Oh, by the way, maybe other people like the way I tried to fix it. And I think you really need to have that level of authenticity. Actually, I should I should uh, coin a phrase, authenticity through suffering. Can I trademark that? <laughs> authenticity <laughs> through suffering. <laughs> That's the true uh, meaning of open source. Nice. <laughs> authenticity through suffering. I like it. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I'm kind of skeptical about, you know, sometimes you do encounter people who just seem to be sitting around thinking, oh, what open source opportunities can we create a business around? And, yeah, I think to me that feels, you know, a bit, a bit fake. Mm -hmm. Or like a, the oft-discussed uh, technical co-founder. I have an idea and I'm looking for a technical co-founder. Yes. Uh, hmm. yes. This might not work out for you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, these days, um, you know, it's the uh, pitch in the um, iOS mock-up. <laughs> yeah. So one of one of the things which so Spring Source was acquired by VMware, and one of the big focuses that VMware had after Spring Source was acquired was Cloud Foundry, and there was a lot of cloud focus it seemed. What are your thoughts on how the cloud is changing software development and does the term the cloud even make have any real meaning anymore given that it's been used to sell everything from servers to breakfast cereal? Yeah, I, I honestly think the time has come to um, get rid of cloud. While I was in terms of getting rid of terms, I would love to get rid of cloud and no SQL um, both while we're at it because they're both they're both misused and there's also so much difference in some of the different technologies they encompass that, you know, using that word to lump it all together is misleading. Yeah, I think it's gotten, gotten totally ridiculous uh, now with respect to cloud computing. I mean, what is not describing itself as cloud computing anymore? Um, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that um, IBM actually decided to kill off 123. I don't know why they didn't call it 123 Cloud Edition. Um, <laughs> you know, there's almost nothing that's not cloud. Um, with respect to the impact on development, though, I don't think we've reached the potential that we, we could have done. And I frankly don't think there's been a huge amount of innovation, in, um, particularly in the PaaS space. And I think, I think that is a pity because I think more, more could be done. Well, another question I have is what are you working on now? I, I know the answer to one of those is Scala because I've, I've seen you discussing that on mm. Twitter, some of the Scala stuff that you've done. Uh, what are you working on? Like what, from the Scala perspective, what are you building? Are there other things you're working on? So from a um, Scala perspective, I'm really writing code for my... Um, on a hobby project, um, basically one of the goals um, was to learn Scala and that's something that I've found very satisfying. I think it's, you know, it's really healthy to learn a different programming language and I'm glad I chose Scala because I think it's a very nice one. Um, what I'm actually um, doing is in the financial space, so I've always had an interest in algorithmic trading. Uh, so it's you know, completely different from anything that I've done in um, you know my previous career. Hmm. Interesting. And there, there's been a lot of interesting stuff that's come out of the financial space. Like I think of LMAX and Disruptor and some of the stuff that they've done, and how a lot of those become open source. It seems like that drives a lot. It drives a lot of work. Drives a lot of innovation. And now is starting to drive open source stuff as well. Like LMAX has been pushing a lot of their stuff into open source, and Martin Thompson as well has become. Person's done a lot there. 
I think I think it's actually interesting as an example of how open source grows. That there's been a greater awareness in the uh, financial community that the competitive differentiator doesn't lie in that kind of infrastructure. So you know, it actually makes sense to contribute and hopefully get other people to contribute to some of the shared infrastructure and build competitive advantage for the business on um, top of that. So I think I think we'll see more of that. I and mean, I think with the financial space, one of the reasons it does tend to drive interesting things like Disruptor is it's immensely performance critical. So if you look, for example, at a range of things that you need to do, say, back testing, it really doesn't matter how fast your software runs. It's got to go faster. So for example, if you're building, you know, even if you're building an incredibly high volume consumer facing uh, business, Maybe it's different if you're Twitter, but you know, if you're running a very, very successful uh, business, there does typically come a point in time where you can say, you know what, this is fast enough. I'm not going to waste uh, more time trying to optimize it. Whereas the financial space tends to be very different. And it's not even limited to places like HFT. I mean, obviously, HFT latency is going to be an enormous issue. But even if you look at trading strategies that are not, um, using HFT um, timescales, typically they need to be back tested, and they need to be back tested with you know optimization of a very wide choice of parameters. And so instantly you can you know look at um, tens of thousands of back tests. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that it's been the financial space has been a big consumer of technology, and one of the reasons that it's now starting to generate some interesting open source projects is that it just has this pretty dramatic demand for better performance. Hmm. It's interesting. When you were talking about that, I was suddenly reminded of an article I read very recently. It was talking about multivariant equations that were being solved using a D-wave quantum computer. And so where you have something like a 400, 480, 490 qubit quantum computer, and it was able to find optimal solutions for a multivariant quadratic in I think, pretty much constant time. It was like half a second. Uh, and that, yeah, it, it's interesting. That that might be one of the things that drives forward quantum computing. Huh. Well, I mean, take, for example, let's suppose you want to do back testing of a trading um, algorithm. And you wanted to, say, run on every tick on, say, the Russell 3000 probably looking at around 1,500 ticks per second. So, you know, think about the trading day. Every trading day, 1,500 ticks per second when the market's open, you know, 200 days a year for 20 years. Um, okay, you might in practice want to go back 20 years, but even if you wanted to go back, say, four or five years, the volume is incredible. And you're going to want to test even the same algorithm, you're going to want to, to test it parameterized in different ways. So yes, I would imagine that if quantum commute computing becomes commercially viable, you will find that um, the finance guys will be all over it. Interesting. They do tend to be early adopters. I mean, we found in um, particularly in the early years of Spring Source, most of our sales by dollar value were um, in the finance space. I mean, this was this was something that I remember as CEO gave me a bit of concern in um, late 2007 when things, in early 2008 when things started to go wrong that I think at the time about 70% of our revenue um, came from the financial space predominantly in London and New York. And we ultimately diversified very successfully where we were you know, accessing a very broad range of customers. But it's interesting that you know, the Large um, banks, and particularly investment banks, were amongst the earliest large-scale adopters of Spring. So they are willing to um, adopt technology early because I think because what they do tends to be very complex, and because they need to develop a very large amount of code, they really need to get the next technology pretty soon. So, you know, when they see something that can lead to productivity improvements for their developers, you know, that is something that um, gives them potentially more immediate benefit than it gives to the 
the majority of organizations. And it's interesting because when I think of banks, when I think of financial institutions, they're usually the stereotypical example of where something moves slowly and two-phase commit and laborious processes. And so it's interesting to think of them as being one of the drivers on the kind of frontier, on the frontier of software development. Well, I think it really differs between banks. For a start, retail and investment banks are very, very different organizations. Um, and, you know, if you think about, for example, what people are doing in investment banks, they're generally open to, you know, new approaches. Um, they typically actually want to avoid things like two-phase commit because they want to, you know, try to have a simpler um, architecture. But yeah, I mean, they've, they've definitely some very talented people um, in that space. And fortunately, they are quite often allowed to do interesting things because, you know, the business knows that it has to be able to move fast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy.